Hey, there's four steps that you need to master in order to navigate the wilderness using nothing but a map and compass, and I'm gonna give them to you right here. Hang on tight. Hey, welcome to the channel, friends. As always, man, I am stoked to see you. So I'm going to demonstrate each step that you need to master in order to hone your ability to navigate the wilderness using nothing but a map and compass. And as I mentioned, there are only four steps, but there are some sub-steps. There are some things, some categories, some areas that we need to master in order to do these four things. The first step is you need to know where you are. Then you need to plan a route, stay on a route, and recognize the objectives. And so when it comes to knowing where you are, I'm going to demonstrate how to orient and read a topographical map, as well as plotting your point, your location, on the map and then we'll start talking about how to plan a route so we know where we are but we need to determine where we're going to go and how we're going to get there so we'll demonstrate how to plot a point whether we're using a grid coordinate or whether we're looking for a major or minor terrain feature and we'll demonstrate how to measure distance and direction as well as accounting for declination so that you can stay on the right track and then out in the bush i'll demonstrate how to actually stay on the route so we're talking about using dead reckoning and terrain association. How and when to use steering marks, reverse azimuths, panic azimuths, how to negotiate obstacles using deliberate offsets and handrails. Right, and then we'll end up right back here. We'll do a quick review of all the things that we did and it should be a good show because we're gonna move out about 10 clicks. So uh, let's get this thing to it. All right, so we'll take a quick pause and we'll talk about some of the gear that you're going to see me using out here in the bush. You don't need to get overly complicated with the gear that you're using. I'm just going to be using a military topographical map, a protractor, a lensatic compass, notepad, and a pencil. If you're looking for any of this gear or more, whether it comes to food, fire, water, shelter, first aid, navigation, communication, all kinds of stuff, look down in the uh, description below. You see a link over to my Amazon influencer page. And so the first thing we need to do when it comes to, to wilderness navigation we need, is we need to know where we are. So we need to orient our map. So if you're just starting to learn this thing, one of the easiest things to do so that you're not making any mistakes is just get down on the ground. We're going to open up our compass, break out our map a little bit here. And I'm gonna set my compass down and I'm gonna look for true north. And I need to reorient my body here. Because what you wanna do is you wanna ensure that as you look down on a map and you look up, what, what's in front of you is what you see. There we go. And that's why you don't wanna try to do this on your knee because you're gonna be constantly fidgeting all over the place. All right, just rotate around to you about have the north on your north seeking arrow in line with your grid lines. We're not looking for perfection here. Uh, we're just trying to get it generally oriented so that as we look down, when we look back up, it just makes sense. So look down on your map, look up, it should be, it should be, ref it should be reflected. You can imagine how confusing it would be if your GPS had never stayed oriented. You'd never know how to turn left or right. And so a map is a graphical representation of a portion of the Earth's surface as drawn to scale and seen from above. And topographers use different colors and symbols to represent both natural and man-made features. We have five primary colors, and that's green, blue, black, brown, and red. And some of that will depend on whether it's a red light readable map or not. So green is vegetation of military significance. That's gonna be things that are over three feet tall. So your typical larger tree lines. Blue is for water. Black and red are for both man-made features. Black is typically going to be smaller. Red may be more prominent. Brown 
is going to be for relief changes in elevation and relief and now the other color that we don't often talk about but we can see on a map is going to be white white will represent vegetation that has no military significance for example it could be a golf course it could be a open sand dune it, it doesn't matter but there's not vegetation over three feet so that can be a key importance when it comes to learning how to terrain associate and of course on every good map we're going to have a quality legend that's going to help signify anything that's particular to this particular map that may not be on, found on other maps. Now there's other information down on the legend below, including our scale, we'll look at that here in a little bit, and a declination diagram, we will also review that as well. We'll get back up to where we are, and we'll start plotting where we're at now that we've oriented, and we know where we are. Driving down this road, I took a right, and then came right off the road, so I know that we are right here. It's important to make sure that you're using a pencil that has a finer point. Is if you start using uh, larger pens or markers or something on a map, not only can you not erase it, but it's gonna leave a mark that is gonna be absolutely huge. So I wanna plot where we are, and so I'm gonna use a military protractor. And on a map and with a protractor, you always read to the right and up. We'll see on our map on over here on the left side, that we have these numbers ascending, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and then running uh, from left to right also ascending, 13, 14, 15, 16, and it keeps on going. And this is all part of the military grid reference system. This is how cartographers uh, basically make a flat earth on paper and it's by using these grid reference system and it's all broken down into 100,000 meter squares and then it just keeps breaking down. Just important to know that you read right and up. So we know that we are right here in this grid square of 1, 6, right? We read to the right 1, 6 and then up 9, 9. So I read to the right until I get to the bottom left hand corner and I see that that's one six, and then I read up, and I see that we're going above nine or niner, so I know that I'm in this grid square right here. So I'm gonna set my protractor down, and I'm gonna slide my protractor to the right. You always start with zero, zero on the bottom left-hand corner. I slide my protractor to the right until the black marking from my pencil is directly underneath the edge of my plastic line. And now I can read up. So I know that I'm in 1, 6. I'm going to start writing this down. It's always good to take good copious notes. One six, and then we said we were in uh, niner, niner. So I'm going to put that off over here. So 1, 6, and it looks like we'll call it. And just read right here. So that's seven, we'll call it seven four, nine nine, and then read up, and it looks like, we'll call it six nine. And now we know where we are, and we have an address, and that's exactly what a grid coordinate is. It's basically an exact address. So it starts off with a four digit, which is again one six nine nine. We know that we're in this grid square, but that's a thousand meters, one kilometer by one kilometer. Not very accurate. If I gave somebody and said, come find me, and I'm somewhere in this grid square, it might be kind of hard to do that. So then next up, we would have a six digit, and that's gonna get us to within a hundred uh, square meters. Again, not overly precise if I'm trying to look for something small. And then next up would be an eight digit, which is what we have here with 16749969 and that's going to get us to within 10 meters and now dialing down even more even closer you know is going to be a 10 digit grid cord and that is going to get us to within one square meter or three feet pretty stinking accurate gps's will give you that kind of accuracy when it comes to plotting you really can't plot a 10 digit because of the width of my pencil actually won't uh, allow me to. Right, and so we'll zoom all through this area. We're gonna start here. We're gonna plot a location, determine distance and direction to go to this hilltop. Then we're gonna swing back down over to this hilltop, which has a height of 162. 
and then we're going to swing over here and look at Ragnar Lake and then we'll come back up to our starting point. So in order to do this, uh, you know, I always recommend to get, get your route plotted the entire way through. So again, we know that we're going to go to this hilltop right here. And for this instance, I'm going to demonstrate again how to uh, plot a grid coordinate. So again, we're going to set our protractor on the bottom left-hand corner. And this is going to be at 17907. And then we're going to swing over until that hilltop is right underneath that line. Make sure it's right underneath that line. And then we can read what our protractor says. Now every protractor is a little bit different. Some have squares, some have triangles. So I know that this is going to be, this is our starting point. And so uh, point alpha is going to be 17. It looks like that's 85. And then 97. And if I read up, that looks like a, we'll call it an 8.2. And so that's point alpha. The next point is, I said we're going to come down here to 162. And I can see, we'll make this a Bravo here. And so our next point is going to be this hilltop of 162. And so again, we'll call this point Bravo. So we're, we're still in 9, we're still in 17. But this time we're all the way down at 9.5. So read to the right. Get that right. Black mark of 162 right underneath there. Read there. Looks like that's a, call it a 2.5. And then 9.5, what we call that a 8.5. And then from here, we're going to move all the way over here to Ragnar Lake. So for this one, I'm actually not going to plot a grid coordinate. I'm just going to come over here to Ragnar Lake. And along the way, as we're moving over there, we'll talk about uh, terrain association and some different ways. Because, you know, most civilians, we're not plotting points. You know, we're just moving from hilltop to hilltop. So it is important to keep that in mind. And then from Ragnar Lake, we're going to move back up to our starting point, so we're going to come back up to our SP. And so now we need to determine some direction. So I'm going to take my protractor, I'm going to line it up from where we're starting from down to where we're going, which is this hilltop, and I'm going to make a line out down here off to the side. And then I'm going to put my protractor with this center mark right where we're starting from, and I'm going to read down to where this line is, which is right here, right? So a, a, a compass has 360 degrees because it's a full circle. So we're measuring in degrees. And it looks like that's going to be 100 and we'll call it 53 degrees. So to move here, we're going to move at 153 degrees. And that's grid north from Bravo to or from alpha to bravo we'll get this lined up here make a nice solid marking down here put the center of my protractor on that hilltop we're going to go to and then read down to that line which reads 196 degrees again that's grid north from a hilltop 162 over to Ragnar Lake. I'm going to cut off on this edge right here. Get a little line going there. I'm going to bring this center of our protractor right onto 162. And then read our degrees. So that looks like that's 335, 36, 37, 38. 138 degrees grid north and then from Ragnar Lake back up to uh, our starting point here is going to be ten, eleven, we'll call it twelve degrees 
grid north. Now that's a grid north. Before I pick up and start using my compass, I need to understand what my declination is, which is the difference between grid north and magnetic north. So we come back down here to our declination diagram, and it's going to tell us exactly what to do. So this is our GM angle or a declination diagram, and we can see it tells us the difference between grid north and magnetic north. There are three different types of north. The other one is true north. Uh, when it comes to using a map and compass, we don't care about true north at all. We only care about this difference, this arc between grid north and magnetic north. We can see on this declination that was uh, done in 2005. If you need the most up-to-date, you'll go to NOAA's website, type in your location, and it will give you the most up-to-date time now declination. We can see this one is 17 and a half. I happen to know for my area that it's actually 15 and a half degrees. And so to convert from a grid azimuth, which is what we did when we plot a points, we have a grid azimuth to a magnetic azimuth, we need to subtract 15 degrees. So minus 15 there, minus 15 there, minus 15 there. And so this is gonna give us 138. And that's our magnetic azimuth. It's going to give us 181 degrees. Again, that's mag. It's 123 degrees. Magnetic. Now on this one, because it's 12 minus 15, I know that I, I know that I'm going to be going backwards, so it's going to be 357 degrees magnetic. Now I need my distance. So if you're trying to move a distance of less than a thousand meters, you can actually just use your protractor uh, as, a, as a scale. But I'm moving over a thousand meters. I'm moving outside of my uh, grid square. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this with a starting point line right there. And I'm going to read out over here to that hilltop. Now I come back over to my scale we had mentioned earlier and I just set my scale down like this now I can see that it's past 2,000 2, meters or past two clicks so I'm gonna back this up so I can read backwards so I can see that because this is broken down in increments so that's gonna be we'll call that uh, 2200 meters All right, so I'm going to move it 138 degrees at 2200 meters. So now I just need to do the same thing. I keep from making a mistake here. I'm going to erase this line because I'm going to use the same sheet of paper. Because right, we need to go from uh, this hilltop down to 162, which is pretty sticking close again, right? It's probably going to be like right at 2,000 meters. Come back over. Double check what we got. That's, we'll call that 2,050 meters. And now we need two more measurements here. Same thing again, get rid of that line, and then measure from Ragnar Lake back to Hilltop 162. Right there. And these are all close to 2,000 meters. I couldn't plan that any weirder. That's it. 2100 meters. And last up is going to be from Ragnar Lake back up to our starting point, which is so again, we slide this back over this way. 
And then we just read to the left here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, call it 1850 meters. All right, so now we know distance and direction. All right, so the last thing we need to do is to understand how long it's going to take us from our starting point to point alpha. Uh, and then stopping on, the, on this hilltop and this road and intersection along the way. And we're breaking this up uh, to help make it a little bit more manageable because nobody wants to keep an azimuth that far. So we're going to start uh, determining our distance to the hilltop. And I can just use my protractor here, set my protractor down on the hilltop, measure back up to where we're starting from, and it looks like that's about 400 and 50 meters right and then measure from my road intersection to this hilltop which reads about 650 meters which means that from this road intersection back down to uh, our hilltop here should be just over or pretty close to a thousand meters you can see, it, I'm looking at a thousand meters, so it may have been off a hundred. So hilltop alpha is one thousand meters, right? So now that I have this, I can determine uh, my pace count. I'm going to take this number, 450, and I'm going to divide it by 70, which is going to give me six legs. Well, six. We'll call it six and a half. This is going to be nine, and this will be 14. So your pace count is how long it takes for you to step out from A to B, and that's going to be a 100-meter interval. Now, I already know what my pace count is. It's 70 paces. So what you need to do is find a 100-meter interval distance that you can use to check your pace count. It's best to do it in the natural environment, but it's not rocket science. It's an art, so it's okay if you're a little bit off. You could use a football field from end zone to goal line, 110 yards, about 100 meters. Right? You could use a range finder and plug out 100 meters. All kinds of ways that you can use to help determine your ability to get your pace count started. But what you want to do, make sure, is that you're just know in your head that when you start, you count every left foot. So one, two, three, four, and then you just keep going until you get down to 100 meters, mark down what you had, turn around, move back in the exact opposite direction, and make sure that you were right. And then if you're in the military, you probably need to also know your running pace count. You need to know what your pace count is going to be at night, because there are all kinds of variables and factors that will determine and dictate what your pace count is. It's never going to be the same. When you're working on your pace count, wear all your load-bearing equipment. So if you have a heavy pack, make sure that you're wearing your pack when you're getting your pace count. Right, so before we step out, I wanted to look at the map and then see what we're going to encounter along the ways because it's important to truly read your map and understand what it is that you're moving through. So I can see uh, I have a hardball road here, and then this hardball road over here comes down this way, and it kind of loops back down and comes around this way. So I know right off the bat that I have some panic azimuth, a panic azimuth. A panic azimuth is nothing but an azimuth that you can shoot from anywhere that you're in an area, and it's going to take you to a known point. Now, I couldn't use 180 degrees and move south because depending on where I'm at, I may hit a different road. But I do know that if I shoot a panic azimuth of 90 degrees, no matter where I'm at, in this, I'm going to hit this hardball road. And then from there, I can determine where I'm at and then move it back up or just start to move back out again. I can also see that as I'm moving from my starting point, I'm going to move uphill right here. And it's going to kind of crest out and stay level. I'm going to pass a road and I'm going to start coming up a hilltop here. Then just working from here straight out, you know, 2,200 meters, you can't keep an azimuth that far, so you set some benchmarks along the way. And then moving down from Point Alpha to Bravo, right, we're going to move down and up a saddle, right, we see a hilltop here, hilltop here, so we're going to move down and up a saddle, we'll have some sparse vegetation, and then we're going to start moving downhill, uh, and then to get over to 162. And from 162 to Ragnar Lake, 
I'm, we're actually going to hand rail this road. We'll talk about that then. We'll get over to Ragnar Lake, and then from here we're going to move uphill, and we're going to come back to our starting point. And along the way, I have a couple road intersections here that can help uh, me stay on the right path. Now, the only other thing that I need is a total pace count, but again, I'm going to work my pace count uh, from e each different leg. So I think we're about ready. We're going to get on our gear. We're going to shoot an azimuth, and we're going to get out of here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about compasses. All right, so a compass is a precision instrument that determines a direction from you straight to the magnetic northern pole, which is actually the, the negative pole of the Earth. It's kind of weird, uh, but you can learn more about that in some of my other videos. So it also enables you to determine variations from a line of travel or an azimuth or a bearing. We kind of use these words uh, interchangeably back to magnetic north. And these are degrees, the lines of travel that we're going to be following on. And so that's what we did earlier when we started from where we're at at our starting point, determining a direction to point alpha that was grid north. But again, we want to make sure if we're going to use a compass that we count for the declination. Now we have our magnetic north. All right, so this one happens to be a Model 3H Kamenga. That means it has tritium on it. You have some that have uh, phosphorus instead of tritium. And, but this one has a shelf life of 10 years for the tritium, and then after that it won't be any good at night. But between now and then, this thing shines bright uh, like it's going out of style. So again, it will determine uh, the direction to north. Then you have a bezel that you can spin around. These numbers that you see on the inside that are red, those are the degrees. On the outside, those are black, those are mills. We're not overly concerned about mills. Uh, at all when it comes to conducting land navigation. You and your compass may or may not have mills. What you need to know is your degrees. This is, is pretty shock proof for the most part. I do have a little crack in here. You know, I have deployed, I've been around a few times. So I know that the first azimuth I needed to shoot was 138 degrees. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate my body until 138 degrees is directly underneath my line of travel, which is this fixed black index line. And then from here, I can rotate my bezel until the tritium marker there is in line with the tritium marker on my north seeking arrow. Now my compass is preset. Right, so the reason that's important, having your compass preset, is because as you're moving along and you stop and you check down if your compass has drifted left or drifted to the right, you know that you just need to reorient your body, get that north seeking arrow in line with your tritium marker on your bezel plate, and then I'll put you back on the right azimuth or bearing and you can move out. All right, so, but now I'm ready to actually shoot 138 degrees. So I'm gonna look out, I'm gonna see if there's anything I can use as a steering mark and there's not. All I have are these big old trees right out in front of me. So I have my compass preset at 138 degrees and I can use a center hold technique which is bringing the compass back up to the center of my body as such and looking out at 138 degrees or if I could see a lot further away, I could close up my compass and use a compass to cheek method by bringing the compass up to my eye and then looking down at the red dial on my compass at 138, but I don't see anything out there. That's a super useful tool if you're trying to, to determine an azimuth, uh, but if, you're, if, you don't, if you can't see out there, there's no reason to actually use that technique. Right, so I will stop and look down at my compass about every 50 to 100 meters to make sure I'm on the right azimuth and that I haven't made any deviations from where I'm trying to go on my line of travel. I know my distance, I know my direction, it's time to step out. One, two,
somewhere about on the top of the hill. And uh, as you can see, moving up a, a, a small portion of that, it's got a little steep. And that's important to know that as you're using some terrain association, and what that all that means is that you're reading the map and you're looking at both natural and man-made features to understand your direction. So in a couple of the areas that we just came up, you know, it's kind of a steep, that's kind of steep, right? And so if we look back at our contour lines, we can see that they were a little bit closer together. The closer contour lines are, the steeper the elevation change is going to be. And so going back to the difference between dead reckoning and terrain association, when we started off, we started off using some dead reckoning. Dead reckoning is using a compass. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. If you're out on the open water, man, that's all you got to do is dead reckoning. But when you have the terrain, sometimes it can be super fast and super efficient to use some of the different features that we have. Again, whether they're man-made like roads or buildings or natural like hilltops, like what we have right here is a perfect stopping point to stop off for a minute before we go on to help make sure that we're moving out in the right direction. Right, and so I know uh, based off of all of our route planning prior to, that's why it's important to do that. Plan your route before you step out. That way you're not second guessing yourself along the way. And double check your work all the time. Uh, so from point A, or from the hilltop to the intersection, it's gonna be 900 meters. This one's gonna be a little bit trickier. So that's 12 legs. And again, at the same uh, azimuth or the same direction. So we can always stop and, you know, always wanna double check what it is that we're doing. And it was 138 degrees. And we got a little different setup there when I set up the camera. So it's 138 degrees right here. We're going to keep moving. Should start to uh, level off a little bit. And then we should be able to make it to the intersection. And no matter where we get to the intersection, this is going to be using some train association. If I miss it, if I don't hit that apex right on the nose, I can use the road in either way or another and just move to that intersection and go from there. So that's kind of like an attack point. An attack point is a known point that's not on, that's not you, an attack point. An attack point is a known fixed spot that you're going to be able to recognize along the way that you can use to help shorten up your path to get to your objective. Super tricky, super awesome. It's already uh, hit the intersection and moved on about 200 yards. Had some, had some activity uh, in the AO that I, I didn't want to disturb. But you can see I had this wide open field off to my right, kind of hand railing. We'll talk a little bit about that more uh, along the way, but hand railing this road that which curves around. And now I got to keep on my azimuth. Um, and so we're going to keep moving towards this direction. It's a lot easier to move where I'm at right now up on, up on top of this plateau area as opposed to when we first started and we were moving up. Uh, if you remember, you know, it got pretty steep there for a little while. It looks like a good spot to take a knee up here. Um, and that's important to remember as you're contemplating your pace count and you're factoring in how much time that you have available to move from A to B and what you're going to encounter along the way. You need to really Pay attention to the map and what you have available to you uh, because that elevation change is going to make all the difference in the world. This is just a nice little spot. No Widowmakers. Nice little open clearing. Uh, so let's set this down and we'll have a chit chat. And that's because the terrain that we're going to encounter is going gonna, is gonna to have a significant impact on our pace 
count. Again, we talked earlier about doing a pace count on level ground. That's all well and good. But out here, hopping and weaving, bobbing and weaving, up and down, all the ins and outs is going to have a significant impact on your pace count. And that's why you need to know your pace count on a normal flat terrain. You should know your pace count moving uphill, downhill, through some thicker vegetation at night, which is probably going to be similar to thicker vegetation, uh, as well as you know having a full load on your back because yeah, all these things may impact it. Sometimes you may have a pace count of 200 paces for 100 meters. And other times, if you're running pace count on some flat, easy ground, it may only be about 50, 52, 53, somewhere in there. So the other way that you can kind of keep track uh, and stay on your route is by knowing how long it takes you to move 1,000 meters, right? So 1,000 meters is, is about 3,300 feet, right? So we convert from, from, from metric system to imperial. And 3,333 feet is, you know, just over half a mile. If it normally takes you about 15 minutes to move a mile at a pretty decent pace, then you can imagine that moving 1,000 meters may take you about 7 or 8 minutes. So it's just a little different thing that you can put in your kit bag uh, to think about the kind of time it's going to take you to move and you know because you also need to be cognizant you know as you're moving out how much time do i have am i under a time limit and when you're under a time limit too many times it starts to impact your survival mindset whether it's for an evaluation or in a real life scenario when you start feeling that what you have to do has to happen right now and you're not trained and proficient and you're not and you're not confident in your skills and your abilities and the equipment that you have it's going to have a significant impact because it's going to start making you make wrong decisions and that's why we take five minutes to plan prior to moving out that's why we take the time to measure twice and cut once all right let's get out of here Important consideration to account for as you're moving through. You may have seen sometimes, depending on uh, where the camera's been, that we've shifted left or shifted right to move around a, a tree or a shrub or you know whatever it is that we're encountering. Um, and, and that's important to know because as you're moving out, you're probably going to find yourself drifting a little bit to the left or to the right and not actually able to move in a straight line the entire way through from A to B. Now that's okay, but you need to understand sometimes if you can account for it, then move to the left around a tree one time and move. Ooh, stinging. Oh, that's some blackberry bushes right there. Starting to come in. It is that time of year. You know, move to the left. And then, uh, you know, move around to the right. It may help, you know, keep, keep you from drifting off too far into one direction or another. And again, anytime you have any doubt, you just pull out your compass. You double check what your azimuth is. And you make an adjustments from there. Oh, black bear bush. Please leave me alone. I'm going to get up here and stop by this fir tree. Just moved out my distance. Should be about the top of. Uh, Mound, you need to shoot a new azimuth. So we'll double check uh, what it was. And looks like we had uh, 181 degrees magnetic. So that's.
And I'll just use the center hole method. That's 181. Rotate this bezel ring again. I ain't got nothing. I got one dug fur that's about 20 meters uh, in front of me. Other than that, I don't have nothing. The compass is preset, so we're going to check it up as thick as this is right now. Probably every, uh, every 40 40, 50 steps, I think. Now, you remember, uh, looking at the map when we got started, in about somewhere around 400 meters, I should come across this pipeline. And uh, so that'll be a good steering mark along the way that we can use. May not know exactly where we're hitting, you know, that, that linear terrain feature that we're going to hit. But it's good to know that if I only moved, you know, two sets of 70, so it would be about 200 paces and, and through here i'm not even going to get is my pace count is probably going to be upwards of 90 so i have to think about time and, and distance in addition to my pace count like we all, like what we've been talking about but if i haven't traveled far enough i know that i'm not going to hit uh that, that yet so it's kind of a the uh so it's kind of a deliberate uh terrain feature that i can use it's a man-made feature and one of the things we need to be cognizant of is that maps do change and both natural and man-made features, they may disappear and they may appear. So pay attention to how uh, old you, or new your map is. Oh, hello there. We got some, uh, this is a, this, this, this right here, this is a treasure trove, man. That's nothing but pitch. So this old Doug fir, been wounded for some time. And if I needed to start a survival fire out here, that's exactly what I would use. I just pick some of that apart and and go to town. Oh goodness gracious. <laughs> oh man, that's what the elk love right there. Take a few for a little snacky treat. If you don't know what you're doing, don't, don't eat uh, what you come across. Uh. Oh, like this guy right here. She was not on the map, but we'll use it for a little bit. The thing about paying attention to to how trails and roads work, it's important to remember that trails and roads all typically lead to a destination or they lead to a larger trail or road. Now, game trails can also be used, as well as you know some foot trails or, or jeep trails, uh, to help keep you on your path and, and use some use some of your gut uh, that's been tested, and your metal is a little bit uh, you know stronger. You, you've been around the block. You, you made a few mistakes. You made a few good decisions along the way of whether or not your trail is gonna do and take you where you think it's gonna take you. Cause you need to be careful, man. Every year, thousands of search and rescue operations are conducted to recover the injured, wounded, or lost, man. You don't wanna be one of those. Right, so uh, here we are coming up on the road and the pipeline that we saw on the map. And this is about as good of a time as any to talk about how to negotiate 
an obstacle. So, you know, obstacles come in all shapes or forms. Sometimes they're more linear based, sometimes they're more area based. And we need to figure out, no matter what it is, it's something that we can't get through. Uh, so we need to figure out how to get around it. So the classical way is to use a box method. And so the first thing we have to do is, is, is to decide if we're gonna go to the left or to the right around the obstacle. In this case, we're gonna go to the right. So I'm gonna add 90 degrees onto my original azimuth of 181 and shoot 271. I'm basically gonna conduct a right phase. Now before I start moving, I need to make sure that I have my pace count written down for where I'm at right now, because I'm gonna need that in the future step. And once I have my new azimuth, you know, I'll look and see if I have a steering mark and take some copious notes. And then I'm gonna start stepping off as far as I need to, to get beyond the obstacle, right? Because I need to know that I, I can work my way back to the opposite side of the obstacle from, from where I'm at right now. So I'll start stepping. And in this case, I'm only gonna to need to take seven steps or seven paces, as it were, to get beyond the obstacle. Again, just as a demonstration. And once I get here, I'm gonna uh, annotate how far it was that, I, that it took to get beyond the obstacle, and then I'm gonna execute a left face. I'm gonna face back in my original line of travel of 181 degrees. Again, I'm gonna take down copious notes, and so I'm gonna get ready to move. Again, I can look forward to see if I have any kind of a steering mark that's gonna help keep me pointing in the right direction, or I just use some dead reckoning using a preset compass. Now, once I'm getting ready to move, I'm gonna pick up my pace count from where I started from. So if in the case I left off at 60, Four, I'm going to start off with 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, and then 70. So here I am. All right, so always take copious notes. So I need to execute a left face and then start moving off on a new azimuth. Now I'm going to remember that I wrote down that I took seven paces away from my line of travel. So now I need to work seven paces to get back on my line of travel. Right, and again, once I'm here, right, start writing notes down. You can face back uh, from the direction that you're coming from because maybe you had, you know, it was a larger uh, obstacle that you're trying to get around and maybe you had a large terrain feature that you could look back to and shoot to make sure that you're on the exact path as opposed to just relying on your pace count alone. If you don't have this, that's fine. You know, trust your pace count trust your compass, trust your experience to work you back here. And then once you're good, you know, you're gonna face back on your original line of travel and then start stepping off from there. And you remembering that you're gonna pick up off of the pace count of where you ended up at. So in this case, you know, I, I did end up at 70, so it was too easy. So now I'm gonna step it off with one. Make sure you get all your gear secured and now you're ready to get back off into the bush. You can see why I use an orange paracord for my compass, can't you? You can see that thing a mile away. Stock one's black. One, two, three. Come on this road, get up on top of this hill, and it should be able to shoot over to, to the lake. Thick. Ugh. Can't see anything. Can't see the ground. There's logs moving all over the place. Dangerous business. I'm on a little cut log. Didn't even realize it. Now one wrong move, man, and it's it's out of yours. You got to be careful when you're moving out, making sure that you have all the supplies that you need. Take care of. Uh, you know, some first aid and, and whatnot. You have to be in a hurry 
we start getting in a hurry and that's when uh that's when things start to go wrong we just come down over here you see it's kind of been used Go ahead and follow this up to the top of this hill. Look out for dens. Sign scat. You name it. I think we'll call this uh, top of the hill. See down to that road. And then uh, we're right about the top. Some more berries, more hackleberry. Quite a bit of that. The break here is uh, decent enough. Shoot our azimuth. That's what we had to, had to get at from here to make it down to the lake. And again, we didn't plot a coordinate. We're just looking for the lake itself. So that lake is 123 degrees magnetic. Had another 2,000 meters, oh my goodness. I'm getting my PT on today, brothers. 123 degrees. Here's somebody out somewhere chopping some wood. 123 degrees. Let's see. Mm. I'm gonna use center hole technique. And then once we're set, we're gonna rotate our bezel ring until that tritium marker on the bezel is in line with the tritium marker on the north seeking arrow, which I know it's kind of hard to see there with the angle that I'm working with, but it is. Now I got my distance and direction. I'm gonna look back on the map before I step out because as I recall, I can use this road as a handrail as I start moving out on my azimuth. And so here we are at the top of 162, somewhere in that vicinity. And as we start moving on our azimuth, uh, you know, I'm going to hit this road. and I'm going to handrail this road uh, until we get all the way up to Deschutes. So let's uh, go ahead and step it out. All right, so ordinarily, uh, it's a little, little short-winded here. You know, using a handrail. So what, what is a handrail? A handrail is a linear feature that is moving about in your general direction. It's, it's on the same azimuth. It's leading to a place where maybe you can uh, stop and then use it as an attack point, which is just a point that is closer than where you're at right now, and shoot an azimuth from there to your final destination. Right, and so a road is a linear feature, and all handrails are going to be linear in some form of fashion or another. Maybe it's a road like this. Maybe it's a power transmission line. Maybe it's a stream, a river, a railroad line, whatever it is. It's something that's moving in a direction. You know that if you moved on the other side of it, you'd be moving in the wrong direction. So you know you need to stay on one side or another. Now, in some situations, you may have to travel 50 meters or 100 meters on the side of the handrail, but you can still use it to keep working parallel. And as long as you don't cross over, you can always stop and then move back in. All kinds of sign around here. It's not gonna be the, the prettiest lake that there is. See how, how mucky this is. Oh, dude's been coming down here to get some water. The sign's old. The ground's so wet.
But there's Ragnar Lake. So, oh, it's some raspberries too. Right on. Uh, can bring it back up in here. So, we'll look at the map again real quick. I already got it out. And let's see here. So, we need to move back towards our starting point. So, we're going to be moving uh, uphill uh, from where we're at get back up on kind of that plateau we're going to cross that pipeline again that's going to take us uh that's going to take us some time to get to that pipeline but the good thing is again i have that panic azimuth and a panic azimuth is a direction that you can move no matter where you're at and it's going to take you to a known feature that you can work out from there to determine and figure out exactly where you're at it's kind of a safety net same with all these other roads that are around here um, you know, if, if I moved in any direction too far, I'm going to hit a hardball road. If I hit a hardball road, man, I can't, I, I don't need, I got no business crossing that thing. So just kind of a safety, and that's all that panic azimuth is. So I think in this case, we're going to move up. Um, we're going to hit that underground pipeline. And then I'm going to hit this intersection on it uh, where this road is. And then we'll use that kind of as an attack point from here. So an attack point is, again, it's a point that is closer from where you're at to where you're going. And it's going to enable you to stop at a known point. It's a fixed point. You can find this point. So a road intersection, a major bend in a river, a major terrain feature whether it's man-made or natural these are all really good examples of an attack point so you know if you're moving out in the direction and the azimuth and the bearing that you need to you can find this point and then from there it's only a short distance because you only want to keep a solid azimuth you know for moving through brush like this for a shorter period of time especially until that you're getting pretty good at this stuff so let's uh let's double check our azimuth To what it was that we needed to shoot from here which was 357 degrees almost almost north right 357 degrees so again i'm gonna pull out the old trusted compass you know every time that you're using a compass you need to make sure that you're keeping all metal objects away from the compass and i'll show you how that needle can get affected even by something uh, as small as a knife. So 307 degrees. Always hold your compass level. Rotate that bezel ring back around till you're in line. Speaking of the bezel ring, on a Kamenga compass, every time that you click, that's three degrees. Every time that you click, Three degrees, three degrees, three degrees, three degrees, three degrees. Some base plates compass, it might be two degrees. But that's important to know, especially if you need to make adjustments on the go without being able to use any light. Maybe you're moving at night and you have to rely on the knowledge that you have. You also need to remember that as you move your bezel ring, you can always just do some math, right? So 90 degrees, 180, 270, how many clicks does it take to get around uh, to whatever it is what direction from north uh if you're facing north would you need to move uh your bezel ring to have at 45 degrees you can kind of eyeball that as well if you can you know if you're not looking for something that's overly precise All right so i'll demonstrate how a compass can be affected by a ferro or electromagnetic object so ferro magnetic which is going to be like a solid steel titanium is not going to be that big of a deal uh, and some other metals will not be, but steel is all that carbon. And as you can see, right, I can make this thing move and chase all around the way I want it to. That's pretty crazy. So high powered transmission lines, vehicles, anything that's electronic radios, you need to make sure that you keep your compass away from these objects uh, so you can make sure that it's not having any outside interference for what it is that you're trying to do so you can get out and move from there. Let's do this. All right, so I'm a, I'm a little frustrated. 
So right here behind me is the hardball, uh, right there at Stedman Road. Um, came all the way down the hill to it and did not see, uh, uh, well, not, not the road, right? It is a road, but it's the, the gas pipeline here and did not see the cutoff that I was looking for. So I'm gonna walk back up this hill and we'll see if we can't find this thing. And that's why you have to be careful when you're just trying to run and gun saying that you're gonna use nothing but terrain association. A, because most people who use that phrase have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. B, man, things change over time. I'll give it this, we had a, uh, a sprint of summer the past week, but today has been beautiful and overcast, a perfect time to be running and gunning out through these hills. Uh, that being said, you know, you come out, you do need to make sure that you're thinking about your calorie intake and your water intake and making sure that you're not using more resources than what you're taking in. Came all the way from on top of that hill. Let me take you back and show you what I found. The map on the ground and it's oriented. So once I look up, I'm gonna be looking in the same direction that we are on the map. So we can see off to our right is the incline and the hill that's rising up. And we have the hardball road down the road on our left and out in front of us, there should somewhere in here be a dad gum road. But as you can see, there is nothing. You can kind of see where maybe there used to be a road that cut through here, but at some point in time with all the overgrowth and all of the flooding that's happened and the water building and standing, that uh, that road is no more. That road is no more. You can almost kind of see where there's a, a clearing over on the other side. You see through that opening right there. You can kind of see that on the map as well. And of course, here we are a lot closer uh, to the top of that hill. That, that only looks like a couple inches right there. But that's a, at least a solid 85, 90 feet uh, rising up from where we're at right now. And of course, way down over there is where we came from. So what that means ultimately is I didn't find nothing. Nothing. Oh my gosh, we're going back to the road. You know, that's a couple, couple key notes here. Um, a, again, man, you got to be careful about what it is that you trust on a, on a map and what it is that, that you do not trust. Most of the time, you can trust exactly what you see on the map, depending on the date of it, is exactly what you're going to find out in the world around you. If I had to take a guess, this road actually probably broke off right, right in, right in through there, right? You can kind of see where it, where it opens up, you know, right, right there. But I'm getting tired and, uh, I'm gonna choose a different path uh, just to help demonstrate that sometimes, you know, you have to punt. And in this case, we're gonna come up to the hardball road. I'm gonna determine a new distance and direction. I'll use this as my attack point. And uh, we'll move off from there. Should make things a little bit easier, a little bit easier. Right, so as you can see on the map, it's not going to really do me any good to uh, to get an asthma. It's going to literally take me right alongside this road. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to walk down the road. Just take this up to uh, try to get, out, get run over by a car that's coming up behind us. Um, to that intersection that's right off this hardball where we parked the car this morning or the truck this morning and stepped off from there. Here in the rumble strip, should be getting close.
Man, we put in some miles today, and I appreciate you hanging out for the ride. I hope you got something out of it. If you did, make sure you like the video. And if you want to stay up to date on some future content, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. And we just keep this conversation rolling. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, make sure you leave some comments down below, man. I will hit you back up. And as always, man, until then, you stay stoked.